very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, I've come here tonight straight from Brussels, which is more than can be said of the Prime Minister who's still there. But I've heard in the last ten minutes that a deal has now finally been done. So perhaps we could put David up for an Oscar. <laughs> because he kept telling us he was battling for Britain and he was up till five o'clock in the morning. A deal has been done, but what kind of deal is it? Just think back three years to that Bloomberg speech. The high vaunting ambitions. The fundamental treaty change. The change of Britain's relationship. Powers back to the United Kingdom. There was even talk of reform of the European Union itself. And what has happened over the last 48 hours is a British Prime Minister has gone to meet 20, 27 other heads of state and frankly given an impression of Oliver Twist by saying, please gentlemen, can I have some more concessions? Is that what we've sunk to as a nation? I think we're better than that, don't you? Yeah. I think we're better than that. And this deal, this deal that he's done, and we'll get the details perhaps in the next hour or so, but this deal that he's done does not address the fundamental issues that British people care about. It does not address the issue that our Parliament is not able to overrule bad EU law. It does not address the issue that we should not be paying £55 million a day to a club whose accounts have not been signed off for nearly 20 years. It, it does not, and it does not address the fundamental issue and the number one issue in British politics, which is that we have a total open door to over 500 million people. It does none of those things, and yet, and yet, after a cabinet meeting at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, there'll be a press conference and the Prime Minister will tell you he's won this amazing deal that we've been given permission to limit migrant benefits for up to four years. Well, even that deal is no good because the European Parliament have the ability to pick it to pieces and veto it and any other promise of what will be written into a future European treaty can be struck down by the European Court of Justice. Dave's deal is not worth the paper that it's written on. And yet, and yet when Donald Tusk wrote to him on the 4th of February, he said the deal looked so good that he would now, in a referendum, vote for Britain to join the European Union. Well, let's have a little think about that, shall we? Imagine the Prime Minister saying, I'm calling a referendum on June the 23rd to ask you, the British people, to join the European Union. Yes, I know that since Simon de Montfort, we've had a sovereign parliament, but really this is now rather outdated, and wouldn't it be better if henceforth 75% of our laws were made elsewhere. He would say that our Supreme Court hasn't been doing a bad job, but really, wouldn't it be better to hand over the ultimate judicial power in this country to a court in Luxembourg staffed by people, none of whom are actually judges? <laughs> he might say, I know you've been familiar with the idea that a nation-state controls its borders, that a nation-state can decide who comes to live, work and settle in that country. But for goodness sake, we wouldn't want to be like Australia in the modern world, would we? I mean, the idea, the idea that we should stop people coming into our country who've got criminal records just shows you how Australia's changed, doesn't it, really? <laughs> No, no, anyone can come in, we'll have a total open door to over 500 million people. Uh, the concept that the National Health Service 
could deal with 65 million people again, wouldn't it be better to open up the health service to 508 million people? I'm not sure that would go down very well. He'd probably say that the idea that we have control over our seas up to 200 miles of the North Sea is really terribly unfair on our European neighbours and what we're going to do is close down the British fishing industry and give it away to Europe. Oh, and by the way, for the benefit of all of this, we're going to pay a membership fee <laughs> of over £50 million a day, which is the equivalent of building a new district hospital every single week. Does anybody in this room or in this country think that we would vote now to join this European Union? <laughs> well, absolutely right. And what we're going to be asked to do is asked to remain in a union that will not be static. We'll be asked to remain in a union that has now a very ambitious foreign policy, which I believe in many ways could prove to be dangerous. We'll be asked to remain in a union that is fanatical in its attempt to centralise all power and to sweep away the ability of nation-state parliaments and the electorates to change the laws by which they live. We'll be asked to remain in a European Union that is so hell-bent on expansion that it now wants, within five years, for Turkey to become a member. We'll be asked to vote to remain in a union whose currency is clearly a failure, where tens of millions of people in the Mediterranean have been impoverished, and we'll be asked to vote to stay in a union whose migration policy, as expressed by Mr Juncker, and then by the one that seemed to be um, inevitably heading as the greatest modern German leader, but not any longer, Angela Merkel, whose disastrous decision to say, oh come all ye faithful, <laughs> has, led, has, led, has led to a million people settling in Germany in one year, and now we see Schengen under collapse. We're being asked to remain in a union that has no popular consent anywhere in Europe, asked to remain in a union that when it was frank with the peoples of Europe, when it said it had a constitution, saw the, saw the French and the Dutch reject it, and yet ignored their will and pushed on with the Lisbon Treaty. We'll be asked to remain in a union that now resembles a burning building, but the good news, folks, is there is an exit door, and I suggest we take it. There will be, there will be, there will be arguments over the next few months about economics. There will be arguments about trade. There will be arguments about security. There will be arguments about defence. But there's one argument above all that we in this movement must grasp and we must understand that actually what has happened in our country, perhaps ever since Suez, back in the 1950s, is that our ruling classes have collectively lost faith in our ability to make our own laws, to control our own borders, to make our own trade deals, to stand on the world stage. They make arguments. They say, we're not big enough to be on our own. We're not strong enough to be on our own. But what they mean, what they mean is we're not good enough to stand on our own. And their chief spokesperson now, Emma Thompson. <laughs> well, Peter Mandelson thinks the same thing, doesn't he? Tony Blair thinks the same thing, doesn't he? Nick Clegg thinks the same thing. And, oh, did we get more booze for Clegg than Emma Thompson? I can't believe it. But the point is, ladies and gentlemen, they don't think we're good enough. They don't believe in this country. They don't believe in the people of this country. And I do believe in the people of this country. And this campaign, this campaign must be upbeat and optimistic. This campaign must be about respecting those that went before us 
and defended parliamentary democracy against the world at war and our determination to hand that legacy of freedom, liberty, justice and pride in who we are to our children and grandchildren. This is what we're fighting for. This is what we're fighting for. Thank you.